Good morning. Uh, thank you for logging into the webinar. Uh, I'm not sure what to expect this morning. It's the first time I've I've done a webinar like this, so hopefully uh, you'll find it useful and uh, and probably more of a refresher than learning. I think we're covering it, but I know there's and um, you're all very experienced people out there. So uh, as I say, hopefully you'll find it uh, interesting. Uh, why am I being asked to do this? Well, I have spent some time in uh, working in this kind of area for a number of companies. Um, as I carry said, I've also a, a lecturer at the University of Hull part time. I do I cover transport and road risk safety there. So uh, I, I'd like to think that I've got a a reasonable amount of uh, experience in it. I don't consider myself an expert. I consider myself a practitioner who's got a keen interest in the subject. So as I said, hopefully you'll find something interesting in today's session, which we can move on. Oh, sorry, it's, uh, I'll start to move on in a minute. Thank you. Right there. Where are we? Ah, there we go. Uh, this is what I'm aiming to cover today. So we'll We'll look at, uh, it's an overview of uh, what legal requirements there are and then start to look at some core issues really uh, of workplace transport and also driving at work which uh, we've got to look at at two different angles really. They are, they are different uh, areas to, uh, to consider with different types of controls. So that's what we're going to cover today. So as I said, there's two routes to look at. We have the uh, one where we're driving on public roads and the other where we're driving and people are driving in the workplace itself and transporting the workplace. So first of all, we're going to have a look at workplace transport. So what is workplace transport? Well, I mean, any vehicle or piece of mobile equipment that is used by employers, employees, self-employed people or visitors in any work setting. So we're quite clear of that. Sorry, I've got a visitor coming in. Uh, so the extent of the problem, well, it is significant. Uh, there's many, many people killed every year and injured in accidents involving workplace transport. Uh, there are clear statistics on the Health and Safety Executive site if you, if you need to look at these. Most common causes, people falling from, people being struck by a vehicle, objects falling from a vehicle and vehicles overturning. So those are the core, you know, the common causes of uh, accidents at work on uh, using mobile vehicles so probably not a surprise these are these are the four so to stop that hopefully uh, we can and we have the legal controls in place so specific legislation for workplace transport uh, workplace health safety and welfare regulations uh, really controlling uh, safe traffic routes and ensuring that they're in a fit state to to keep keep safe tra traffic around the, uh, the workplace. Provision and use of work equipment regulations also plays a part regarding the specific work equipment to ensure it's maintained. Uh, there's also a mobile work equipment we have to consider that goes on public roads as well. And so uh, part three of Pure really looks at that as well. And keeping the workplace safe, safety signs and signals uh, again plays a part in ensuring that uh, you know the, the workplace is in a fit state uh, and a safe state to operate. Now there's very very good guidance uh, regarding workplace transport. HSG 136 is uh, extremely informative uh, and certainly, as you know, you will be able to download a copy of that. And I suggest if you are involved and looking at workplace transport, you do obtain a copy of that publication. And, uh, just to touch on, don't forget, other 
pieces of legislation which are very, very important, as we know. Health and Safety Work Act plays a part, the management of health and safety and work regulations, and as already mentioned, the workplace health safety and welfare regulations, safety sounds and signals regulations, and provision and use of work equipment regulations. So that covers legislation uh, to the degree that we're going to cover today. So we now start to look at a little bit of or detail about workplace transport. So the, the guidance, HSG 136, does follow an extremely good uh, ethos and way to manage workplace transport. So we have the safe site, safe vehicle and safe driver points, which we can use to manage workplace safety uh, for driving. So the first stage, as we, we know, will be risk assessment. So I'm just going to cover some factors to consider in risk assessment. I'm not going to cover uh, all the hazards. <clears throat> I'm sure you wouldn't want me to do that. But we're going to cover some risk assessment <coughs> factors. So let's take a view. So employers have got to control or must control the risk in the workplace, as we know. Uh, so we'll consider the main types of accidents in the workplace, should we? So the main types of accidents we, we see in the workplace are people being struck, falling items, striking people, uh, falling from vehicles and overturning. So they're principally the, the main types of accidents. So we've got to consider that when we're assessing the risk. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have to, typical considerations are the activities which are going on. The actions of those near the vehicles, uh, the number of vehicles on site, if it's a very busy site, we have to look at separation and, and trying to manage that type of influx of vehicles. And they could be from anywhere and maybe not near the site. So we need to take that into account as well. And the features of the site. I've, uh, I've undertaken work on many different sites. And certainly when you're, you're looking at places like uh, petrochemical, uh, or sites very different to the public roads and therefore you've got to take that into consideration for drivers certainly new to the site coming on and uh, so we need to take specific uh, precautions in that instance. Uh, so therefore the design of the traffic system plays a big part in that. Also look at training and competency uh, and down to pure we get into maintenance of vehicles and not forgetting environmental effects as well. So the the make the you know the, the road system, the uh, how the site is, and uh, we'll we'll maybe take a look at some of those a little bit later. Oops, sorry, just trying to move on. And, uh, Excuse me, I'm sorry about this. Uh, just decided to, to not move on at the moment. I'll just, uh, excuse me, I'll just uh, try and get this, this back to working again. Where are we? Ah, there we go. So, there are some other hazards of sight or, or transport which we don't uh, always consider. And as well as driving about, we've got some vehicle, uh, which is like coupling. Coupling is one. Uh, so, if you're not sure what coupling is, this is uh, an example. This is from some work I did from a construction, construction uh, logistics company. And so it's where the tractor unit has to connect with the, uh, the flatbed. So there are hazards around this. So it's not just about that driving, it's about the, uh, the driver 
getting between the tractor unit and the flatbed and actually linking it all in and also loading was what I need to there. So there's a number of related you know, as it's a wet bus transport, we have to control. So, getting to the control, safe site, safe vehicle and safe driver, as I've said, an extremely uh, useful way to look at it. Although, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I will just take, uh, go through quickly to show you what that actually looks like. So safe site, if we look at that, it starts to look at the makeup of the site, traffic activity, and such as, you know, what happens with the traffic, reversing, signaling, uh, coupling, you can see there. So that's identified and loading, I've just mentioned. But also uh, walking on vehicles, sheeting, netting, uh, work around the loading bays. So ensuring those are all safe. Uh, and also the design of the traffic uh, movement around the site. Uh, we've got such things as speed limits and surface conditions. So I mentioned environmental issues. So environmental issues is where surface conditions and makeup would play a part. Uh, so physical traffic route control for safe operation. Uh, we've got to look at the width of the routes, uh, markings, one-way systems. So these are all things I'm, I'm sure you're, you are used to considering. And uh, finally, on in the workplace, avoid pedestrian access, uh, site rules. And then we start to look at the vehicles uh, as well as part of that. So that was safe site. And then, so as we go on to safe vehicles, start to look at the makeup of that. Uh, site restraints, visibility, reversing aids, aids so the sounders, uh, sensors, maintenance repair, uh, rollover protection, fall on protection, uh, seat belts, as you, was, you would expect, and the maintenance of them. So all rider counterbalance, counterbalance fault lift trucks fitted with either a mast or rollover protection structure should be fitted with a restraining system. So there are specifics which you need to consider. And risk assessment should be undertaken for persons required to continually mount and dismount the machine, typically related to seat belts use. So that goes continues. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of those. We, we are limited with time uh, today. And then finally, safe driver. So we look at the selection of drivers. Once selected, how do we train them? The different levels of training required. Uh, also, it, the level of training depends on previous experience as well. And, and risk assessment will play a key part in this. I'll call it that in that, sorry. So, control, really managed by safe site, safe vehicle, safe driver. Uh, as mentioned, it's an extremely useful ethos to use or system to use for looking at vehicle safety. Shared workplaces, uh, just a note, we have to cooperate with other employers, especially like if we're uh, on logistics companies uh, and de making deliveries. Uh, we have to really consider what's going on on site. Uh, so take reasonable steps to coordinate the measures to take and meet legal duties. So reasonable steps to tell the other employees about risks to their employees. Certainly if we're driving something unusual, wide loads, those kind of things. So the workplace, the overview of the workplace uh, and then we get to driving at work so work related road risk so this is public roads this is where we're, we're driving for work on public roads and the, the next 
really part. Now, another HSE guidance document, which is extremely useful, is Managing Road Safety, so L24. Uh, and not forgetting our legal responsibilities, uh, Health and Safety at Work Act still obviously applies. The management of Health and Safety at Work regulations, but also we bring in the Road Traffic Acts, the Highway Code, uh, Pure Part 3, as I mentioned earlier, in particular, uh, really looks at vehicles which also go on the other, this might be a forklift truck having to move between sites. So we have, we have to look at Pure Part 3. And also for those working on highways, uh, we look at Road and Streetworks Act, so RASWA, and uh, Chapter 8, which starts to control how, how traffic management should be set up during roadworks which is something I have had to deal with in the past and uh, can be very fraught. So on the road, the extent of injuries again is incredible. As you can see there from the figures, up to 100,000 injuries, uh, 30 to 40,000 well, over three days it was there. Uh, so there are many injuries resulting from vehicle movement on public roads and many are not, or most, are not reportable under RIDAR. So we don't have that, that data. Uh, the cost, again, incredibly high, 15.6 billion, and uh, could increase massively for not reported accidents. So who's at risk? Well, many, many of our employees, workers are at risk. Just to have a look at some examples, uh, as you will be able to see there, a whole range of people, uh, delivery workers, emergency services, uh, coach drivers, passengers, also uh, couriers, food delivery. So many, many of our people are at risk at work. So basically, if you drive as part of your job, you are at risk. So the immediate causes of crashes on the public road, so speed, inattention, falling asleep, uh, traveling too close, drinking drugs, adverse weather, vehicle defects, and highway conditions. So they're the norm for immediate causes of crashes. So then we have to take that another stage, don't we? And underlying causes. So this is where us as employers and uh, certainly safety people can come into this and start to look at underlying and root causation and try to ensure that these are uh, stopped really. So pressure uh, of people at work having to get from site to site quickly and using an appropriate speed. Uh, I've worked for some companies who actually log speed, have a live feed of speed in their vehicles uh, to monitor this. So that's an interesting technological concept. So distractions, inadequate sleep, uh, congestion, and probably the frustration caused by that congestion. Uh, stress, like I mentioned earlier, you know, having to deliver from site to site uh, in very, very quickly can cause a, a great deal of stress for people, I'm sure. Uh, so poor journey planning can play a part in these accidents. Uh, maintenance of the equipment, of the vehicles, and not routing. Poor or poor routing, so unsuitable routes, that plays a part as well. So the factors associated with driving at work, they increase the risk. Uh, distance, driving hours, schedules and bad planning, so, uh, stress due to traffic, weather conditions and roadwork. So these are all things we must consider as part of our risk assessment and our planning and then trying to 
work the best solution. So clearly you can see here, the rehab or the employer has an impact on crash risk. So it's made worse by too far to drive in a day, uh, too fast, so incentives to speed, uh, it's finishing and getting early, uh, unsafe routes, conditions, vehicles, uh, stress, tired and train drivers, the use of mobile phones, which is obviously a, a big issue, and in a general poor health and safety culture. So we can see on the other side of this, these can be improved and there's clear ways to improve these. And so I won't go through them all, but certainly on unsafe roads, we can look at journey planning and making sure uh, we're sending people in the right area. Certainly when I've worked in that area before, I've always checked on the, the roads prior to setting up routes. Are there any roadworks intended? Are there any delays? There's sites which you can use for this. So uh, how is agency sites are very useful for having a check before setting up the journeys for, uh, for staff. So leadership, let's not just check. Uh, so it's leadership, isn't it? In many ways by, uh, you know the the employer to ensure that the culture is is good and safety conscious and with that we we, we start to look at other guidance and clear policy like in all our areas of health and safety a strong clear policy is essential uh, to ensure driving risk is reduced so the standard road traffic systems from the BSI, uh, BSI ISO 39001, which is from 2012. A very useful document if you can get hold of that. And gives clear direction on uh, policy for road traffic safety uh, management systems. And we do it because it's moral, obviously. We don't want to have pain and suffering. There is a business benefit uh, to ensuring we've got clear policies and procedures in place. We can have lower insurance, uh, target resources in the right areas, and direct attention of people into the right areas where the risk is high. So the road risk policy itself, we've got to look at plan, do check acts and apply that standard really in the development, uh, so that for the plan, carrying out risk assessments, ensuring that our written arrangements are reviewed uh, within the content, a clear statement, like many other arrangements, a clear statement of that, and some con controls we start to put in place, submitting mileage, and sure people aren't doing uh, over what they should be doing. Uh, oops, sorry. Where is that? The mobile phone policy, uh, a very complex one to apply, and uh, alcohol and drugs, driving time, licenses. You know, people are, uh, if there are any issues with the licenses, so checks on that regularly uh, is important. Insurance vehicle servicing, training, and uh, risk assessment, as we said there. So the content of the policy should include all, all this type of thing, on vehicle servicing and insurances. We've obviously got to consider the grey fleet. So white vehicles which aren't company owned, which are used, uh, which can cause problems. And we should have continuous improvement like with most policies. So the key elements of a road traffic, the actions to address uh, risk and risk assessment, and that risk evaluation. We start to look at driver, safe driver, safe vehicle. Again, the fitness, competency, uh, the vehicle, suitability, condition, and then uh, other things, safety critical information for for specific vehicles, 
uh, ergonomics and the journey itself mentioned earlier but routes scheduling time giving people enough time to undertake and complete the route and uh, checking the weather prior to people going Oops, sorry there we go so checking driver's licenses are they are they checked how regularly are they checked uh, so that's got to be agreed and then driver training safe driver safe vehicle and uh, safe journey so we have similar kind of way to look at things like safe site safe driver safe vehicle we've got uh, safe driver safe vehicle safe journey so very similar we can use the same kind of uh, way to look at that so within the uh, RTS we should be setting objectives but also support the implementation and ensure that it is coordinated people know about it they are trained uh, so they have got awareness and competence in this uh, the, the documentation is clear and accessible uh, and performance is checked you know do we monitor so again indg 382 safe driver safe vehicle safe journey so this is this very similar the same ethos as prior to workplace driving so we'll just have a quick look at uh, safe driver and there we're looking at competence fitness and health training experience eyesight checks uh, crashes have they had any any convictions any points so we need to as part of the drug license check you know we should be aware of anything that's happened medical issues which have caused uh, problems with licenses and then there is in the safe vehicle very similar suitability condition the safety equipment uh, any additional features required sat nav tachograph uh, making sure that obviously that it doesn't take uh, driver's attention away what is acceptable and then safe journey so we start to look what we said earlier route scheduling ensuring there's sufficient time weather any fatigue uh, is it at night and day so therefore you know different things uh, cause a problem certainly in the in the past when i've had people going out for to deliver training i've tried to ensure that they go the night before or the day before ready for the next day to reduce the amount of time during that day So, driving at work, INDG 382, another extremely uh, supportive document from the HSC and Department for Transport. Oops. So, finally, from the RTS, develop an action plan. So, the management system for vehicle and uh, transport uh, roadway sorry driving for work assess the risk prioritize interventions set standards targets time scales for implementation and then implement a monitor monitor review and feedback any lessons learned what are we monitoring as i've said earlier the uh the, is it the speeds and the uh that people are driving and some very useful support documentation from the hsc 10 steps uh so <laughs> give drivers a break from brakes again an informative poster which can be used in the workplace but there's also some specific information such as health and safety and road haulage uh, i mentioned falls from vehicles earlier on so there's clear information on that and also how to secure a load safely so there's much information on the internet 
and in documentation, which will be useful for anybody challenged or you know, tasked with putting policies together and providing information for the management of either workplace transport or uh, driving for work. So again, just a reminder, specific guidance, it's just G136, a guide to workplace transport, uh, INDG 382, driving at work, sort of management of work-related road safety. Certainly wants to download. Oops. And also uh, online resource. That one was from HSC Vehicles at Work uh, area of the site. So hopefully that's been informative uh, and not too many glitches. Uh, as I say, apologies, it's the first time I've done this uh, uh, on, on this media. So hopefully uh, it was useful. And um, this is something I always like to leave, leave, leave with really. Uh, words of wisdom from real experts who are in that field. Uh, nothing we do is so important that it justifies injuring our employees or members of the public. So we have to take that in, bear that in mind when we are trying to ensure safety of uh, in transport. Thank you, Richard. Um, that was really informative. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today. We've got actually quite a few questions. So are you ready? Yep. Okay, the first question is, um, do you have any straightforward definition slash rule for when a banksman vehicle marshal should be used versus when it's not necessary in the workplace? Uh, I, don't, I don't really uh, on that, I'm sorry. Uh, generally, banks, well, you said, it is a standard, certainly but the companies I've worked with on this, it's a, a standard to use banksman on site. Uh, so if you if you're on kind of petrocam or logistics, they generally would use a a, a banksman. But I, I don't know of any specific. I'm sorry. I will look that up though. I will check on that, and uh, we can take a look. Okay, maybe you could add it into the. I think we have too many questions today. So you'll have to answer some of the questions after the webinar anyway. So that would be great. Yeah. Okay. The next question is: Are walkways on sites considered a mandatory requirement, or if the space allows vehicle slash people segregate segregation, perhaps? Sorry, could you just repeat that? Um, are walkways on sites considered a mandatory requirement, or if the space allows um, segregation between vehicle and people, perhaps? Well, there should be there should be clear segregation. Uh, certainly, if the, often I've had barriers placed and walkways mapped on the floor, so certainly uh, there should be walkways. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question is: In your experience, what are the most effective methods for segregating pedestrians, public and employees, from the vehicles, particularly forklift trucks, in the workplace? So barriers have played quite a, a big part in the companies I've worked for on uh, routing, really, re, you know, routing the traffic away from uh, employees, really. And also another one is uh, time. Uh, you know, limiting certain times when uh, people are allowed in areas where vehicles are operating. Great, thank you. Can anyone undertake banksman duties trained or not, as it seems such a simple activity to undertake? Well, it should be trained. So there's got to be some level of training for, for people who are operating as banksmen, for their own safety as well as ensuring that they're uh, undertaking the, the job properly. Uh, it could be as simple as sign, you know, making sure that they're making the right signs uh, to the drivers. Thanks, Richard. Where does the need for physical separation become mandatory? Well, the workplace health safety and welfare regulations would uh, would look at the the methods that you would use for separation and, and on risk assessment. 
Okay, construction site frequently changes due to the progress, um, then what will be the risk assessment frequency recommendations? Well, in construction, as I say, it is a moving feast really, and certainly the risk assessment initially will alter as uh, initial formwork is, is removed. So it's, it's an ongoing process really uh, of reviewing things like deliveries, as deliveries are being made uh, for different phases of the project, uh, the number of, of vehicles changes. And, and so it's got to be a, a regularly reviewed area as the changes are made, as a risk assessment. Where there is a change, we should be reviewing a risk assessment for any activity. So certainly with vehicles on construction sites, this should be uh, frequent. Thank you. Do you have any specific controls regarding safe sheeting of loads and safe uncoupling? Well, it's keep, keeping uh, people distances from, from coupling, uh, making sure there's access, safe access to the back of the vehicle for climbing up. Generally, they have a, a ladder which is pull out or steps which pull out of the vehicle so there's safe access onto the back. And there'll be a requirement for a safe platform area for the driver to stand on as they're, you know, plugging, plugging things in. And cheating, there is a raised, uh, raised areas that can access uh, for the cheating. I have seen that used in some sites. So a walkway where people can go up and uh, help them access for cheating and automated systems, yes. Thank you. Where a site staggers a public highway, where will we find legislation regarding tax, MOT, roadworthiness and the law? For a public highway? Uh, well, the Road Traffic is uh, manages that kind of, the Road Traffic Act. Uh, also in, in Pure Part 3, vehicles have got to be uh, fit for use on the road. Thank you. As there is not a defined legislation for retraining frequencies, what frequency would you recommend for FLT drivers, electronic pallet trucks, ETC? Well, the truck is generally an annual refresher training in, in my experience, generally done annually. Okay. What are your views of getting all workers to reverse into a parking spot in car park and the advantages and disadvantages of this? This is common. It's common on certainly Petrico, Petrochem, other sites, it is always reversing into a, a parking space. Uh, the advantages, well, it's, uh, it must be, you can, uh, it's easier visibility wise for movement. If you're pulling out of a space, you can, and you're going forward, you can see anything any vehicles in the way a lot easier than if you reverse it. Uh, that, that would be uh, certainly a positive. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't had any problem with it in the past. Uh, certainly on, on sites, most people have been quite happy to reverse into uh, spaces. Okay, thank you. Could you explain how the working time regulations impact on driving? For example, a construction worker driving for work and commuting all over the country, so they're leaving home at approximately 5 a.m., driving for three hours, working for eight hours, and then another three-hour drive home and repeating this on a daily basis. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's down to uh, assessment, isn't it? And certainly in my, as I've said uh, earlier, in my experience, I've, in, I've ensured that that isn't the case. So if any of my team were working, it's not construction, but it's, it's certainly uh, relevant. Uh, certainly they would go and work for a, a client. I would ensure they went, possibly the, uh, the, they often went the night before. And I've certainly done that in the past. I've always gone the day before. So I've limited the amount of time during the day that I'm, I'm working uh, or traveling. 
So I'm not traveling on the same day there and back. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Interestingly, we have a fair culture arrangements with our TUs, which for the most are employees speeding offences resulting in being a, deemed a slip or a lapse. Obviously, the notice of attendant prosecution generally result in some form of punishment to our drivers. Um, are we right to deal with our drivers in this way? I, I think we've got to take the lead from statutory uh, requirements, haven't we? we there's, there's got to be some, you know, management of people who are speeding. Uh, sorry, Kai, could you just, re uh, just repeat the... Yeah, just bear with me one second. Um, um, so they have a fair culture arrangement with their TUs so that their employees speeding offences are actually deemed a slip or a lapse. Yeah. And is that the right way to deal with it? Well, it's a very difficult one to uh, identify, isn't it? Because whether it's a slip or lapse, which is very, it's very difficult. Uh, I think there's got to be uh, ownership, both ways, you know, of if you are speeding. Uh, I think I'd have to. I, I, I wouldn't like to comment really on that. I think I would have to look at the policies in detail and the fair culture policy in detail to, to, to make any kind of judgment on that. Thank you. Next question. Will the FORS FORS initiative become national? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to uh, again look at that probably after the uh, the session. Okay, no problem. What is your opinion on the decision to relax driver's hours rules? My opinion? Mm -hmm. To relax driver's hours rules? Uh, again, that's something I, I would, I don't think it's for me as a practitioner to, to comment on, to be honest. I'm, uh, I am in possession of all the information to make a comment. Okay, no problem. What monitoring techniques would you suggest to provide assurance that WPT controls are effective? Uh, WTP, did you say? WPT, yes. Again, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Really sorry, I can't. I, I would have to look at that outside. That's not a problem. You can answer these questions after the webinar. Um, with the banksman issue needing training, ETC, can we use someone as a guide without calling him a banksman? Uh, for example, if a small maneuver is involved where someone is just spotting for an FLT driver with small visibility? Uh, that, that would be down to your risk assessment, really, and the control, I would expect. Uh, I think it, you do a training for bank companies very important and whether they're called a guide or whether they're called a banksman training is important for them okay uh, buses and stations use diro why is this different to reversing in sorry stations use what buses and station yeah. stations use diro why different to reversing in uh i i don't know sorry i don't know that one I would have okay. to look at that. No problem. Um, do you believe it will come a time when delivery drivers, white van drivers, etc., will have a similar system of travel distances and times like there is for HGVs? Uh, I'm, again, as an opinion, it's not. It's not unthinkable, is it? It's not. You know, unimaginable. You would. You it would. Be good to have some form of uh, control and uh, you know help the people who are in the white vans with, with driving for driving times. Thank you. What is your opinion on in vehicle monitoring system implementation for all drivers in an organization? Well I don't I, I don't disagree with it. Uh, certainly I certainly the companies I've 
I know that I've used this, have picked up some significant issues they've uh, they've been able to deal with on, you know, when people are speeding, you know, why are they speeding? It gives them an indication that there's some issue there. So there's some underlying issue. So I don't, I don't see uh, a problem with monitoring. Uh, in okay. Um, so this is our last question. Uh, would it be good practice to eliminate the use of banksmen and ensure all vehicles have reverse parking sensor and cameras? This would reduce the chance of a vehicle mobile plant collision with people. Sorry, could you just repeat that? It's very complex. Um, would it be good practice to eliminate the use of banksmen and ensure all vehicles have reverse parking sensor and cameras? I don't know about good practice. It's a, it's a method to try and reduce the use of banksmen, I, uh, I assume. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, a, it's an additional, isn't it? You know, putting on reversing sensors and, and because there, it's, uh, it's as well as, but uh, the use of a banksman is, you know, it is important, especially for large vehicles. I, I have seen some disturbing footage from CCTV where banksmen haven't been used and people have been injured. So I think the use of, uh, or the, the reduction in banksmen, I'm, I'm really not at liberty to, uh, to say that that, you know that it's uh, good or not. Great, thank you Richard. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending today and of course a final thank you to our fantastic speaker Richard Greaves and the Humber branch for hosting today. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>